Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's seminar. And today we have a guest speaker, uh, John Spray, who is a British economist in the research department of the International Monetary Fund. Um, he is working on international trade, supply chains, production networks, and development. Uh, prior to this, John was a postdoctoral fellow and also a PhD student um, in economics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he also worked as a country economist with the International Growth Center in Rwanda and an Overseas Development Institute Fellow um, in, min in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry in Liberia. Uh, his research uses uh, simple theoretical frameworks uh, to motivate empirical questions, um, mainly on how firms' uh, international trade choices interact with their domestic sources, uh, sourcing decisions. Um, John, we are very happy to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, well, not quite be in Bonn, but to be in Bonn virtually anyway. Um, can you see my screen? Um, yes, it's okay, perfect. Go back to the opening slide. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me start with the very boring but necessary disclaimer that um, this, uh, this paper doesn't reflect the views of the IMF or its executive board. These are only my own views. Um, beyond that, let me thank you again for the invitation. Um, and let me thank Andre in particular, uh, partly because, you know, it's great to be here, but partly because I think Andre and I had a conversation seven years ago at the kind of inception of this project. Uh, where we both were working in East Africa uh, and, and you know, we were discussing things around you know, how firms perform and one of the kind of biggest components of how successful firms are seems to be their sourcing behavior, how many suppliers they have and how good those suppliers are. But actually how that process takes place is really not very well known. And so this was kind of the inception of this project, the idea behind this project. And seven years down the line, I think I have a few answers around how that process happens, but you know, I think there's tons more that can be, can be done in this space. Uh, and especially thinking about the, the transition between international and, uh, and domestic sourcing and how that process can differ. So, as I kind of already said, one of the biggest determinants of how firms perform is, is their sourcing behavior. It's not just the firm's own productivity, it's actually you know, how many of its suppliers does it have? Are those suppliers good? Uh, do they supply on time, et cetera? Uh, but we know very little about how that process actually takes place, especially in a developing country context. A particular component that I focus on in this paper is that finding a new supplier might be difficult and one factor which might affect how easy it is to find a new supplier is how many other firms are searching for a supplier at the same time. Now this is a kind of textbook definition of congestion externality so one firm's search can crowd out another firm's chance of making a match. And what I argue in this paper is that these frictions might be particularly binding in a developing country. Uh, I'll elaborate that uh, in the next slide. Um, but not only that might they be particularly binding in a develop, developing country, they may also differ between the domestic suppliers and the international suppliers. So why might that be the case? So here, I, what I've thrown up is a, a quote from a firm. In this case, it's a, a sourcing manager in a hotel in, in Uganda. Uh, and this guy writes, one of our biggest problems in finding suppliers in Uganda is that these firms have limited capacity to be, capa uh, capability to scale up. In one case, we thought we had found a local vegetable supplier with the required standard, but they instead took a contract with another hotel. So what ha what's happening here is this the sourcing manager, he actually wanted fruit and vegetable suppliers um, for, to provide uh, food for his breakfast in his, in his hotel. Uh, and they undertook some costly search. They made a match with a supplier. But in this case, the supplier was capacity constrained. It didn't have the ability to supply more than one hotel at once. And so because of the fact that you know, it was, wasn't able to scale up, actually the search has gone to waste and there's, actually, there's congestion taking place. Now, those of you that are kind of familiar with the labor literature or search more generally, will know that um, externalities are not limited to one side of this. You know, congestion is an important externality, but there's a flip side of that which is there, there's a positive externality. And that positive externality exists if firms share information about searching. And so here I've thrown up a, 
Another quote, this time a C CEO of a tea factory who writes, to find a foreign supplier of packaging products, we speak to multiple other business owners to obtain advice before purchasing. So in this particular case, this firm uh, wanted a jute bag in order that they could export their tea in the re required quality. Uh, there's no jute bag supplier in Uganda, and so instead they were having to, um, to look for a foreign supplier. And so the way they did that was by, um, by asking another CEO of a tea factory who they used, and that, so that information is then passed on. And so in this case, actually, the search process of the second tea factory is made cheaper by the fact that another firm has already undertaken that search. So what we have here is two externalities. And what I, what I argue in this paper is that actually this, this congestion externality is much more likely to exist when firms are capacity constrained, which seems to be likely for the sort of firms we're thinking about in a country like Uganda. Uh, and this positive externality is more likely to exist when we're thinking about international firms who are big and can provide uh, services or goods to multiple different, uh, different firms at once. So this, Paper is set in Uganda. Uganda is a fantastic country. I'm sure many of you will have uh, experience with it. Um, it's, made, it's a fantastic country for many reasons, but for my particular purposes, it's fantastic uh, because it has two relevant policy changes or policy moments. So the first one is that um, international trade costs fell by 25% in 2011. So this was due to uh, a number of different kind of infrastructure type reforms. Uh, and as a consequence, firms move from in the domestic market into the international market. And so that's gonna be important for identifying some of the effects that I'm thinking about in this paper. Secondly, um, search appears to be a, an issue in Uganda. Uh, and the reason I argue that is because the Ugandan government thinks it's an issue. So in 2019, one of their three main targets for trade was to reduce search costs between firms by 25%. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to use that because my data in this paper comes before 2019. However, this is kind of a motivation and it's something I'm gonna be able to, to simulate within my model and kind of uh, demonstrates that at least people in Uganda think that this is a real issue. So what do I do in this paper? I'm gonna do three things. First of all, I'm gonna propose a new search mechanism for a gain from trade. Secondly, I'm gonna utilize quite exciting uh, transaction level data um, to show evidence consistent with that mechanism. And then thirdly, I'm gonna build and estimate quite a, a substantial quantitative model of firm-to-firm -firm search and matching, which is gonna allow me to tease out some of these effects. So if you wanna leave the seminar now, let me just go through the results and you can, you can then, uh, you understand the kind of the main building blocks of the paper. So what's this new search mechanism for a gain from trade? It's coming from the alleviation of domestic congestion. When that trade cost hits, firms are going to search more in the international market. And as a consequence, they're moving from this negative externality world to this positive externality world. And that's going to generate a kind of a welfare gain. With this novel data, I'm going to look for evidence uh, of firms reallocating their supply chains in line with the predictions of the model, and also showing evidence consistent with search externalities differing between the markets. It's positive externality internationally, it's negative externality domestically. And then finally, I'm going to be able to put some numbers on these effects. So what I'm going to argue is that there's a consumer welfare gain from this 25% reduction in trade costs, trade costs, not search costs, uh, which is around 3.7%. But importantly, 12% of this 3.7% is down to the search externality channel. So kind of a quantitative, qualitatively important component of that, uh, of that gain. Secondly, I'm going to be able to show actually that these search costs are really substantial uh, just in their own right. So if you were to reduce 25, search costs by 25% within the, within the model, that leads to a between two and 4% increase in consumer welfare, you know, this, on, along the same magnitude as reducing trade costs by 25%. So really kind of quant quantitatively important. Great. Uh, so I'm obviously not the first person to think about these issues. Um, there's a great literature which I'm building upon. Uh, so in terms of the kind of supply chains and trade liberalization literature, uh, obviously there's a, a big amount of, uh, kind of, of work here. Uh, what I add to this is by incorporating intermediate goods in a, two markets alongside the search channel. Obviously I'm not the first person to think about search, 
But what I am doing is I'm incorporating search externalities, uh, which creates this interdependency between the domestic and international markets. Uh, and I'm also not the first person to think about search externalities in a kind of empirical setting, but those empirical settings tend to be quite um, case study specific uh, and also in reduced form. Whereas what I'm going to do today is build this full quantitative model and consider the magnitude of this new channel, uh, use, like, utilizing this novel data and a change in policies. So it's quite distinct from what has already taken place. Now, this paper is obviously quite large. This was my job market paper. Um, and so given I have half an hour and I've already done 10 minutes of that half an hour, um, I'm going to try and go through each of these sections very briefly and kind of, kind of go through the, the basic uh, intuition without going through all of the detail. That said, obviously, if you have any questions about the specifics, interrupt me um, or save your questions for the end and we can discuss uh, any particular component which you find more interesting. But in the paper, what I do is I first of all set out a simple model which kind of outlines the kind of underlying intuition behind the mechanism. And then try and show you evidence that that mechanism is there. And then build this quantitative model, structure the estimator, and then run counterfactual simulations. Any questions at this stage? I don't, I don't know the format, whether this is a kind of interruptory type of uh, session or not. Uh, when it's online, we usually keep the questions uh, for the end. I think it's easier. OK, great. Uh, then I will carry on. So let me try and give you the intuition behind, behind what I think is happening. So this is the, the essentially a picture of the framework that I'm thinking about. So here we have three different types of agents. We have buyers, uh, consumers, and suppliers. And so buyers, you can think of these actually as kind of domestic retailers. These are firms selling goods in Uganda. Now, these firms are going to sell goods to consumers. And in this world, I'm going to assume there's no search friction. This happens uh, costlessly and um, in a kind of standard market way. However, what I am going to assume is that these, these buyers, these retailers, um, they're going to have to source their goods from somewhere else. They're not manufacturers, they're kind of essentially just intermediaries. And so how do they do that? They're going to search, they're going to undertake costly search in two different markets, a kind of domestic supplier market and an international supplier market. Uh, and so in order to do that, they're going to, they're going to pay some money in order to, to undertake some search. Uh, and they're going to kind of split that between these two markets. And how that search is, uh, takes place is going to be governed by these two matching functions. And so these matching functions, these are really kind of the moving pieces of the model. This is how the, the framework kind of, this is the, how I incorporate search externalities into this framework. So what's happening here is that as I undertake more search, that's going to lead to more matches. But the extent to which that's true is governed by these exponents of the matching function. So if beta one and beta two are large, then that means as, you know, as I search more, it's more likely I make a match. Obviously the inverse is true. If they're small, then, I, then it's less likely that I make a match. And so this is, is how I incorporate congestion and externalities. So uh, keep these exponents in mind. And what I'm gonna to argue today is that if beta one and beta two are small, that means there's congestion in the domestic market. As I search more, it's, I make more matches, but at a declining rate. Uh, and that's going to be quite important if uh, compared to the international market, gamma one and gamma two are large, where there's potentially increasing returns to scale versus decreasing returns to scale. So let me walk you through it's kind of the, I'm not going to show you any equations, but I can walk you through the kind of intuition of the model. And so what I'm going to do now is think, okay, well, I have these, these two worlds. What happens if I reduce trade costs? Well, now it's going to make it more attractive to search for international suppliers, right? I previously I had to pay some costs of using that international supplier. If I reduce that trade cost, it's now going to make it cheaper to use that international supplier. And so if I reduce that trade cost, what that's going to do is going to lead to a reallocation of search towards international markets. Uh, however, congestion in these, both these markets determines the extent of the reallocation. So just to walk you through the kind of intuition, when there's a fall in trade costs, buyers are going to enter the import market. But as they enter the import market, now there's a lot of firms looking for those dupe bags, right? It's not just one firm anymore, it's multiple firms. So that's going to increase import congestion. The extent to which that's true is governed by that matching function exponent. But at the same time, these buyers moving into the international market, they're going to leave the domestic market. They're no longer looking for a dupe bag domestically, they're looking for a dupe bag internationally. And so as they leave the domestic market, that's going to alleviate some of the domestic congestion. 
It's going to now make it easier for firms to match in the domestic market because of the fact that those firms have left. The second thing the simple model showed me is that um, when we reduce international trade costs, this is going to lead to an increase in welfare uh, through a greater matching efficiency if congestion is greater in the domestic market to the international market. So what's the intuition behind this? Uh, uh, one firm is, if we were previously searching in the domestic market, where we have this like congestion problem, suddenly now we're moving into the international market where congestion is less of a big issue. As a consequence, we're moving our, our search from this kind of negative externality world to a positive externality world, that's gonna increase welfare. So that's the kind of the main intuition that, uh, behind why there is a, a search externality channel to, uh, to a welfare gain from trade. I guess at this stage, that's kind of you know, a lot of information. What you're probably thinking is that's all well and good, but is there actually any, any evidence for this, right? Do we know that, the, like, you know, maybe you're hypothesizing this, can you show me empirical evidence that these externalities either exist or that they differ between these two markets? And so to do that, I'm gonna use this quite exciting novel data, which comes from Uganda. Uh, this is Ugandan tax administration data. So this is uh, a number of different tax uh, information that uh, I'm able to obtain from the Ugandan Revenue Authority. The most exciting of which is VAT transactions data. So every firm that's above a certain threshold level uh, is required to report um, not only that it has made a transaction for VAT purposes, but also the unique tax identifier of the firm that it's transacted with. And so uh, in any given period, I'm able to observe uh, firm I, firm I's transactions with firm J, the value of that transaction, but also not only that, I'm also able to observe firm J and also firm J's uh, transactions with firm K. So it really is a you know, quite novel and exciting data set. Uh, and I can then link this with other existing tax data sets. So I can observe at a transaction level also customs information. Uh, and the unique identifier of the firm in the uh, international market, my firm in Uganda, excuse me, is trading with. Alongside business registration data, uh, which includes uh, information about the firm's location, uh, which is also very useful. Um, this is a very large data set. It's over 13 million transactions in the data set. Um, 420,000 firm to firm connections. The first thing I obviously did when I got this was plug this into a computer and make this frankly ridiculous both picture, uh, which somebody told me looks more like a Jackson Pollock painting than, um, <laughs> than anything else. Uh, but the, the, here, this is the 120,000 firm to firm connections. Each firm here is a dot, each uh, edge represents a connection. This is a big mess. How do we kind of uh, make that into a format where we can actually observe something meaningful? So what I do is I throw out, throw out everyone who isn't in the retail sector. We remember the model is thinking about these kind of intermediaries. So we want to care primarily about those. We'll keep any supplier, but the, the buyers will be uh, in the retail sector. Uh, we're going to collapse this to look at only annual changes and focus on the extensive, not the intensive margin. So you may worry about the data reliability uh, in terms of the exact value. Well, that's okay, because I'm going to think more about whether an actual uh, connection exists. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for reduced form empirical evidence of search externalities. I'm already running out of time. Um, so to do this, uh, let me try and go through an example. I think is the easiest way of explaining it. So consider two firms in Kampala, um, A and B, and another firm which may be located in another city in Uganda and Tebe. And these firms are looking for suppliers. And so what I've already argued is the probability of A making a match depends on B and C's search. Uh, and so uh, if there's a positive externality, perhaps uh, if you consider I'm A and Andre is B, if Andre and I are located in the same building, it's easy for us to pass information to each other about you know, this potential supplier. Uh, however, maybe Zanetta is located in, in Tebe from C, but uh, given she's in, in Tebe, it's hard for us to kind of pass information to one another. And so as a consequence, Maybe it's the case that actually that positive externality won't exist there. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna observe these firm sourcing patterns over time and see whether there's evidence that Andre and I are adding the same types of suppliers, whereas Zanetta is adding different types of suppliers 
or indeed the net adding of supplier may actually reduce the probability of Andre and I adding that same supplier, just based on the kind of geographic dispersion of where these firms are. Uh, and so what we do is we, maybe well, I uh, estimate an equation which looks like this, where on the left-hand side, I have information about um, whether a match took place for buyer I from supplier F at time T, and then looking to see whether that same supplier was added by a firm in the same building, next door or in another city and so evidence will be consistent with a positive spillover if that first uh, coefficient this mu one is greater than mu two and greater than zero basically there's, there's information happening at a localized level a negative spillover will exist if that gamma term is less than zero essentially that this is information that this uh, a firm in another city adding a supplier because of this congestion effect reduces my chance of adding that same supplier and given the kind of nature of this paper, I'm gonna run this separately for domestic and international suppliers and look to see whether those effects are different. Uh, can we see that there's kind of different information about um, which, which suppliers and because of this, we think that these firms are kind of structurally different to one another. Uh, and indeed to go through the results very quickly, I find evidence consistent with being in the same location, meaning quite significant, significantly uh, predicting the chance of me adding the same foreign supplier. So if Andre and I, if Andre adds a foreign supplier, an import, uh, it predicts the probability I add that same import in, in a subsequent period. Uh, in terms of the other city effects, it's negative, but there's nothing significant. By contrast, when I look at the domestic sample, uh, the, the effects are flipped. So um, if Sonetta adds a supplier, um, in another city, that's actually going to reduce my probability of adding that supplier in the next period. So what we have here is evidence kind of consistent with um, a positive externality existing for foreign suppliers and a negative externality existing for domestic suppliers. This is all in reduced form. It's all kind of one specific channel, but it's it's kind of consistent with the, the predictions of the model or at least the, um, the mechanism of the model. So I've got five minutes. I think that's okay. We can go through quite a lot in that time. So what I showed you so far is a simple mechanism, some evidence consistent with search externalities differing between these two markets. What I want to do now is think, okay, well, you know, there's, there is this mechanism, can I estimate that mechanism? And to do that, I think we need to build on the simple model because the simple model is very simple. It's, uh, it's deliberately stylized, whereas what I want is a model rich enough to take to the data. And so, Simple model is static, it only has single matches, it has only one-sided search, uh, and it doesn't have heterogeneity of firms. And so in the full quantitative version of the model, what I'm gonna do is add all of these different elements in and make them all dynamic. I'm gonna make buyers be able to make multiple matches over their suppliers over multiple periods. Buyers and suppliers are gonna search. Uh, and we're also gonna add in some buyer heterogeneity, which allows us to think through you know, it's not the case that every firm imports. Um, in practice, what we only what we observe is only the most productive firms import. And so we're going to be able to incorporate that as well. So obviously I'm not going to go through the full detail, but um, I estimate this model by a simulated method of moments. Um, I externally calibrate a number of the parameters. I'm not showing you these here. Instead, what I'm showing you is the internally calibrated parameters. So in this sense, what I showed you was some reduced form evidence that such externalities exist and they differ between the domestic market and international market. I'm going to use a completely different mechanism to try and argue that um, they exist between the, uh, they exist and they differ between these two markets. And the way I do that is by structurally estimating the parameters of the model, the parameters of this matching function. Uh, and the most important bit of that is this bit here. And so I told you to re remember those the kind of the key exponents of the matching function. This is why. What we find here is that uh, there's decreasing returns to scale in the domestic market and increasing returns to scale in the international market. So consistent with the story that these externalities exist and they differ between the two markets. So finally, with all that, we are able to think about, okay, well, what's the actual purpose of all of this? How big are these effects? Can we try and pick up the, kind of the, the actual intuition behind what's going on? So to do that, I run three counterfactual experiments. The first one, uh, I'm going to simulate a reduction in transportation costs. 
if you remember all the way back to the start of the presentation, I told you that in, in Uganda in 2011, there was this 25% fall in trade costs. I'm going to structure the estimate within that within the estimated component of the model and see how much that increases consumer welfare. The second thing I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to um, re-estimate that, shutting down the externality channel. What I'm going to do is I'm going to force both those matching components to be constant returns to scale uh, and to see how much then we increase consumer welfare when we don't have the specific channel that I've hypothesized in the paper. And so the difference in welfare gain between experiment one and experiment two, that's going to tell me how big the, the welfare gain is from this new channel that I'm hypothesizing in this paper. Finally, in experiment three, well, you might care about how much uh, search, costs, search costs actually matter in a kind of direct sense. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate a 25% reduction in search costs. This is in line with what the government was trying to do through a series of proposed policy and see how much that will uh, increase consumer welfare if these search costs are reduced. So what do I find? Uh, so when we shock the system with this 25% fall in trade costs, uh, what I'm able to do is test the external validity um, of the model and observe some heterogeneous responses. This table shows you some of the outcome variables, uh, high trade costs, low trade costs, the change, and then nicely uh, also what I actually observe in the data. So this is where I'm testing the external validity of the model in that the predicted changes I find in the model uh, are qualitatively similar to what I observe in the data, which gives me some confidence that the kind of actual you know, framework the model is looking at is, is matching something like reality. I observe uh, a 3.7% increase in consumer welfare, um, which is kind of consistent with what other people find in the literature, but perhaps on the slightly large, large side. So what's actually happening? I think this is, to me, if you understand this one slide, you understand the full kind of logic behind this paper. Uh, and so what I've done here is I've broken down my firms into different marginal cost bins. And so on the left-hand side of the x-axis, that shows you the most productive firms. These are firms which have the lowest marginal cost. On the right-hand side, these are the least productive firms, firms with you know, very high marginal cost. And the blue line here shows you international search. And so what you can see here is that only the most productive firms are going to search in the international market. This is kind of completely standard. We know from tons of research, Melex, et cetera, that uh, we, this is what we get um, when we have a fixed cost of searching internationally. The, uh, on the other side, you can see this domestic search cost. And so again, you can see that uh, if you are a high marginal cost firm, you're going to search a bit in the domestic market, but as your marginal cost falls, you're going to increasingly search more in the domestic market up to this point where you get to marginal cost bin two, where you can see there's a hump. So what's going on here, this hump is driven by the kind of convex search costs. So uh, if I'm searching internationally, it's difficult for me to search both internationally and domestically because you know, there's some limited capacity for me to do that. And so as a consequence, Actually, the firms who are most productive are searching less in the domestic market than the firms who are second least productive or second most productive. So, Now, what happens when we reduce trade costs? When we reduce trade costs, we see two, two effects straight away. Right? First of all, there's an intensive and extensive margin effect. Firms search more in the domestic market, but also there are new entrants into the domestic market. So we see that this blue line shifts out. There's kind of just a general increase in international search. But the cool thing and the kind of thing that's novel in this paper is we can then see what happens in the domestic market. And so what happens in the domestic market is that there's this shift down in domestic search among these new firms who are pushing out this, uh, who are moving into international search and away from domestic search. So they're kind of shifting, you know, those guys who were looking for duke bags dom uh, domestically are now looking for them internationally. But what's cool in the paper is that this then creates this reduction in congestion in the domestic market. And so that's a people of other firms who are higher up that marginal cost component are able to pick up that slack. And so that's why we see this, this line uh, increase on the other side. So in terms of the effects, as I said before, um, I estimate first of all the, the model with, with externalities. I then estimate the model without externalities. You can see the first consumer welfare gain is 3.7%, second consumer welfare gain is 
So as a consequence, uh, consumer welfare um, is 12% higher if we incorporate this new channel. Finally, um, uh, I wanted to estimate this effect from reducing search costs. And so the effect, uh, as you may be able to intuit, is going to differ whether you target a reduction in search costs in the domestic market or whether you target a reduction in search costs in the international market. And so if you reduce search costs in the domestic market, that's going to increase consumer welfare quite substantially by 2.2%. Um, however, one thing you've got to bear in mind is if you reduce search costs in the domestic market, for you're reducing search costs in a world in which there is congestion. So you, firms are going to search more in the domestic market, but that's just going to exacerbate this problem from congestion, which kind of uh, mitigates how big the gain can be. By contrast, if you were to make that same reduction in search costs in the foreign suppliers and the import market, uh, the consumer welfare gain will be quite substantially larger. And so that's just simply coming from the same mechanism of the model, where if you reduce search costs in a world in which there is this positive externality, the effects are going to be quite substantially bigger. And this graph kind of demonstrates this point where the, the congestion effect um, on the right-hand side is, is kind of mimicking the one on the trade costs, whereas on the left-hand side, this is uh, just increasing domestic search, but not really having any effect on the import market. Okay, so to conclude, uh, the whole point of this I set out was to, so I see if I could identify, you know, but first of all, like how this search process works, is there evidence for, for there being externalities and frictions in this world, which might you know, justify policy intervention? And do there, is there differences in how search firm search in the international and the domestic market. And so what I think I've presented evidence of today is that there's both reduced form and structural evidence consistent with search externalities and search frictions being quite substantial. Uh, and that these, uh, these exist in a positive way in the international market and a, and a congestion effect in the domestic market. What I show through simulations of the quantitative model is that um, this channel is quite uh, qualitatively large. Um, a trade cost reduction will alleviate domestic congestion and lead to a 12% higher increase in consumer welfare relative to if we don't include this channel. Finally, this gives us a rationale for policy intervention. So you know, typically when we think about um, interventions in, in how firms operate, we don't often think about actually how they find and identify suppliers. Uh, this model is estimated in Uganda, but I think the mechanism is potentially general. Anywhere where these types of frictions exist, um, there is potentially a rationale for policy intervention. However, the, one of the kind of conclusions from this framework is that actually lowering international trade costs will have an a kind of additional benefit over lowering uh, domestic search costs. And so interventions such as access to portals, such as Alibaba, um, making uh, trade fairs and other things along these lines available to firms is likely to have a kind of bigger bang for its buck than reducing domestic search frictions. Great, thank you. I think I'm roughly on time, 35 minutes, that's pretty good. Thank you very much. I think that was even faster. Uh, very good. Um, it's amazing the degree of detail in your data. I think uh, that's really uh, unique, as you said. Uh, we can now open the floor for the discussion. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand or you can also use the um, chat function. Um, Maybe before other people uh, start commenting, I, I will uh, ask one question from, from myself. Um, I was wondering if your results would change if you explicitly um, accounted for uh, international buyers as well, um, because in your model, you only had domestic buyers, um, domestic suppliers and international suppliers. Uh, but then if you are talking about uh, the impact of uh, reduction in trade costs, that would definitely also or potentially attract international buyers to domestic market. Do you think uh, it would have a big quantitatively impact or not necessarily what would be uh, the mechanisms? Yes, um, great question. Um, 
and you're you're 100 right this is something that would would definitely affect um, what's happening um a couple of thoughts so while Uganda is very open and does have a, an export sector, it's um it's relatively modest compared to uh, compared to a, a lot of other countries. Um, whereas it does import quite a lot, uh, and so the reduction in trade costs I'm able to see in the data does have an impact on exports, but it's relatively modest and doesn't take place for a couple of years, um, and so. Uh, that's kind of part of the reason I left it out of the model was that I don't really see that bigger uh, mm. kind of reduced form effect from that um, from the reduction in trade costs. But I think that's just because there are structural constraints to firms exporting in Uganda. So if you think about that extensive margin, how easy it is to enter to, to export goods, it's really really hard. Um, and so just a, a reduction in trade costs maybe isn't sufficient, at least not in the kind of short run. Um, mm -hmm. However, I think it's an interesting question if we if you extend the model to incorporate that, how that will then influence the effects. Um, I think probably it won't have a dramatic effect in terms of the, I think the, all of the forces will still be there. So if you think that I'm an international buyer and I'm buying from Ugandan domestic suppliers, all right, that could increase congestion in the domestic market. Um, but I think that you would still see that effect happening, uh, especially if it's a second order, right? So. Um, mm. So it's not going to be as as big as what's happening in the domestic market, which is kind of why I've left it out of the model. It's a, okay. it's a, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, let me follow up uh, before I give uh, the floor to Abdul Rashid. Um, let me follow up with uh, another question. I was wondering um, if, again, your results could be somehow maybe more pronounced if instead of uh, in this quantitative, uh, at least econometric uh, small part that you showed, um, how I understood it is you looked at uh, firms uh, who um, end up having the same, exactly the same supplier. Um, but I would expect that maybe there are agglomerations of suppliers in some places. So this um, like positive, uh, potentially positive uh, search externalities could uh, be bigger if you uh, look at suppliers who are uh, not only exactly specific the same supplier, but maybe suppliers who are also located uh, nearby, like you did in the case of uh, buyers. Um, yeah, just, uh, just yeah, a another fraction. another great question. Um, yeah, yeah uh, so it's something I have been on my list of things to look at directly, and it's not something I've yet had time to to directly look into. Um, but I think it's that's a good point. Um, uh, so one general thought about the paper is a lot of the time in the paper, I'm thinking more about buyers searching for suppliers and not really suppliers searching for buyers. Whereas in mm -hmm. practice, you know, part of the process of talking to firms in Uganda, was, it's definitely the case that both of those things are happening. It's not, you know, it's a simplification of my model, which is a necessary simplification, mm -hmm. but um, it is in practice, you know, it's not just that a whatever a, 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 a hotel is looking for a fruit and veg supplier, it's also the fruit and veg supplier is looking for a hotel. Um, mm. And, but it, it, yeah, to keep things manageable, I, I focus on the buyer side, not the supplier side, but I, it's, it would be really interesting to see whether or not that effect is happening also on the supplier side, looking, you know, basically running the symmetric regression, but mm. um, with suppliers on the left-hand side as opposed to the buyers. Yeah, uh, it's not something I have time to look at yet. Yeah, but I think, you know, even in a simplified form, it still uh, makes sense, kind of, right, your results when you look at the reality. Uh, to give you an example, I have a very good friend who comes from Burundi, but he's located in Durban, South Africa, and um, he at some point opened a small shop, I think, selling clothes or something like this. Uh, so what he did, because it would be obviously too expensive for him to, let's say, go to China alone and um, source uh, stuff directly from there just on his own. Um, he found another, I mean, a couple of other people like him, like small shopkeepers. Uh, so indeed, they uh, they did it collectively. Um, so I think it really yeah. makes sense, um, you know, right. looking at your yeah, results. That's yeah. exactly the same type of forces I'm thinking about. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, those types of anecdotes are, are priceless. And I think, you know, mm. it's similar narratives I've heard. 
where you know firms working together in order to search as opposed to kind of naturally in economics we tend to think about these firms as competitors yeah. but when there's a big kind of cost of that process actually it's more in our interest to bound together in order that we can all find the same supplier at once um, and so me searching and you searching is beneficial for one another it's really good okay uh, let me give the floor to abdul rashid now um, hello hi yeah, um, great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I just have a few comments. And one is maybe um, clarification. So what do you mean by domestic or foreign suppliers? Um, and one thing that came to my mind is, so if we have a foreign company that has some, um, let's say a branch in Uganda, is that a domestic company or a foreign company, right? because we have a lot of these um, um, multinational companies with uh, footprints in different countries. Um, that's one. So, and then the second one is perhaps maybe I was thinking of some dynamic effects among the domestic uh, suppliers. So if maybe you could allow for some learning so that uh, they are able to reduce the search cost for example, to, uh, through some digital technologies. Um, and, and we have, for example, in Nigeria, a lot of new um, digital solutions that, that for example, like uh, there is something they call Uber, Uber for tractors. Or, so there is like a, an IT company that collects orders. Uh, it makes available all these suppliers domestically. So it is able to reduce that friction uh, for matching different firms. Um, I think that will be important maybe to see how you can incorporate that. And, and another thing also closely related to what um, Zaneta said, uh, I was thinking of some network effects. So um, perhaps if you could see, um, do people with different suppliers have differential productivity, right? Because in your model you you just say that more productive firms may source outside than compared to low productive firms but i was thinking if we could it, it would be interesting to look at the opposite way so do people is there kind of networks spillover effect so if you have a more efficient supplier they start transmit to your total factor productivity uh, as well so maybe i think that would be interesting and then um the last thing also maybe about the assumption that there's positive spillover with foreign suppliers. Um, I think there are lots of tensions with trade these days, um, not least some COVID, things like COVID or shocks from trade war um, that could make you vulnerable to all these um, you know, exogenous shocks. Um, do you think now, for example, we could say relaxing this assumption and saying that sometimes firms may prefer domestic suppliers will make sense um, given these current realities. Yeah, but really wonderful presentation. Um, thanks so much, Abdul Rashid. Those are great questions. Uh, and the great part about it is the answer to like at least two or maybe three of your questions is this is paper number two, paper number three, paper number four. <laughs> um, so like these are things I've, I've already been thinking to some degree about, but I think they're super interesting. Um, and yeah, it, it excites me that other people think that they're, they're interesting. Um, so first question was the clarifying question, what do I, what happens if there's a multinational in Uganda? Unfortunately, within the data, I'm not able to observe the kind of ownership structure of these firms. Um, that would be obviously a very interesting thing to dig into in more detail. Um, I'm only, so on the buyer side, I'm only gonna look at retailers, which tend to be more likely to be local Ugandan firms than other uh, types of firms, but certainly they could be foreign firms. Um, and it may well be the case that actually these foreign firms have really structurally different search patterns than domestic firms. Uh, so it's something I, I think would be really interesting to explore further. Unfortunately, within the data, it's, I can't observe directly what types of firms these are. Um, regardless, they're still going to be undertaking search both domestically and internationally. And so they're going to appear in the data like every other firm is uh, undertaking that 
that pattern. Um, I think something which would be interesting to think for future research is, you know, maybe these foreign firms have some advantage searching internationally, whereas the domestic firms maybe have an advantage searching domestically. So actually the structure of how that operates might be quite different. Uh, and it may well be a, a, another source of pl a place for government intervention. Certainly when I spoke to Ugandan policymakers, they're very frustrated that the you know, big international hotel, for example, isn't using uh, Ugandan products, it's using imported products and they would like it to use Ugandan products. So um, I think it's a, something for future research to think more about. Um, putting learning into the model, I think would make things complicated, but certainly, you know, you, you see this in labor models, right, where you, there's some degree of learning and, and would be possible, um, probably outside the scope of this paper, but something potentially to think about in the future. The way I've tried to capture, you know, you had this great example, and I totally agree about the new technology coming into Africa, which makes some of these things easier. And so when I was talking about simulating that 25% reduction in search costs, that was directly what I had in mind. And so when I was speaking to the Ugandan government back in 2019, and they were putting in place these policies to reduce search costs, a large part of that was about getting access to these international or domestic search portals. And so Alibaba is obviously an amazing resource where it used to be the case that I had to go to Hong Kong, find a translator, go from Hong Kong to China, find a factory, uh, you know, get access to my input. Now you can do a huge amount of that online and not only that, but there's also kind of ratings and information about the products. Um, so that's just dramatically reduced the cost of searching. And that should definitely be also true for firms operating in Uganda or Nigeria um, or anywhere else where if I'm able to access this portal, not only could I be able to import, but also potentially export. If I can build a track record that really dramatically improves my chances of kind of being seen internationally. I think it's something we probably should care more about on a kind of policy side. Um, and on the domestic side, yeah, you, you know, Jumio is the biggest ever uh, African IPO. Um, and the reason for that is because it, you know, has the potential to completely revolutionize how markets operate. They're already working with you know, market women in Uganda where you can order on your smartphone, I want, you know, some tomatoes and some okra delivered to my house. And that, that happens right now where a guy will be sent to the market to pick that up for you. Um, so these types of frictions are being reduced. Um, in terms of network effects, uh, I'll push you a little bit towards another one of my papers, which has been a working paper forever. Um, but unfortunately, you know, <laughs> it's, it's something that's on my list of things to address, um, but where I'm directly looking at that. I'm looking to see whether there's kind of a, whether firms sourcing from better firms, um, uh, kind of there's a, a, a positive assorted matching between you know high productivity firms and high productivity firms, low productivity firms and low productivity firms. There's quite a lot of evidence for that I see, but also I see, I see evidence that as a firm becomes an exporter, that effect transitions down to their supplier. Um, so if you go on my website, you can see that there's this, this paper like exists, and so um, it's not something I do in this project, but it's it's something that I think is really interesting and, and there's scope for more work here. Um, on the tensions with trade, I, yeah, this is really interesting. And, and I think, you know, this paper, the data finishes in 2016, the sample is relatively stable around this. So it's not something I think is the focus of this paper, but it's something I'm looking at going forward. And so I have a new project starting up actually both in Uganda and in Rwanda, uh, where we're thinking specifically about uh, border shocks. And we're thinking about a number of those, COVID definitely being one of those, and looking to see where, how resilient these particular supply chains are. So um, do we see particular sectoral divisions in how resilient firms are to shocks? Do we see how these shocks transition, you know, depending on the structure of the network underneath it? Um, and so it's something, again, I'm pushing to future work as opposed to, you know, the primary focus of this paper, but um, it's great how interested, you know, you raise a number of things that I also care a lot about. So, so thank you. Um, thank you. There is a question um, in the chat uh, from Ghazali, uh, who says that's really interesting presentation. Is it possible to obtain information of uh, time spent on search and how will that be captured in the model? And I actually was thinking about a similar thing because uh, I think in your data, you only have transactions that were realized, so were positive, yeah. uh, but you don't really have the data or information on how much time was spent or how much it costs, uh, you know, to 
look for suppliers in case it didn't happen in the end, right? Yeah. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't it, it would be amazing if I had that information? <laughs> Unfortunately, right now I do not. I guess the the way to get that would be to conduct a survey, um, which you know is not something I had time to do, and uh, maybe at some point, but not right now. Um, at one point, I was trying to think about is advertising some element of kind of expenditure on search, but I, I decided that was too spurious a link and gave up on that. Um, but yeah, you, you definitely see these types of surveys in the labor literature. In many ways, what I was trying to do in this mm. paper was adopt some of the things they do in labor, but uh, mm. just not a variable I had and didn't have the resources to go to go obtain, unfortunately, but hopefully in the future. Um, good. Um, Andra. Hi, thanks, John. A very good presentation. I have actually three questions, but I'll try to make them very, very objective. So first one, you said that the firms you analyze are in the retail sector. How about if you go to the manufacturing sector or other sectors that uh, behave a bit differently than the retail, um, what do you think would happen? Or maybe you have done that uh, as a side estimation. The, the other thing is about firms learning from each other and searching together as an ethical content, like the cooperative sort of behavior. But I mean, I think one would expect that more in sectors that are closer to perfect competition. Uh, but if you go, which is a behavior that you would expect a bit more from retailing than from industry. So also related to the first one, what if you move to uh, more industrial firms that has lots of concentration, market concentration, oligopolies, and then this sort of cooperative behavior would probably not be seen. So how would that impact some of your results? And the other one is a policy implication, one simple one. So should government and firms focus more on international markets as a source of suppliers for inputs and perhaps even destination for finished products? Or, or, or is this uh, policy implication, do you think it doesn't, you cannot say that based on your data or maybe they should focus domestically or in, because I mean, you can't focus on both. One would have to be in a priority when you set policies somehow. So what, what do you think in terms of inter international and domestic markets? Thank you, great questions. Um, okay, so first of all, I focused on the retail sector, what about the other sectors? Um, so actually, yeah, you're, I, I originally threw every firm in the data set into the model um, and actually ended up with qualitatively similar results. Um, the reason of moving to the retail sector was actually just general feedback I got from people was, you're throwing in too much here. Uh, there is too much complexity in these other sectors. Um, try like Whereas you know, my model is really thinking not about a complex <clears throat> production process. It's thinking about being an intermediary and focusing on, on search, and that's probably most relevant to the retail sector. Uh, so that's why I, I ended up scaling back. But I, at least you know, when I ran these regressions and this actually the full structural model and the full sample of firms, I still found the same effects. It's just that I think I'm more credible if I'm talking about kind of a, a sector which is is contained as opposed to. Uh, more complex and, and one reason for that to think about that is you know, my model is thinking really about a world in which you have you know a, a very simple chain of consumer retailer supplier whereas if I'm a manufacturer what I may well have is supplier manufacturer supplier manufacturer and you know maybe even a loop uh, and suddenly it's really hard to think about that conceptually in this type of a framework. I have other work where I think more about those more complicated chains, but for this, focusing on retail, it kind of felt a more contained problem. Um, the second question on kind of market structure and where, whether or not these effects would differ between different industries. I think your intuition is, is probably right, um, that actually the, the nature of the industry might well have a, a big impact on you know, if you think back to my framework, I've hypothesized two, two matching functions, right? And they're aggregate matching functions. Whereas I think what you're suggesting is for each sector, there might be a, a different matching function. Um, and that structure of that matching function might differ depending on the market concentration. You know, how, how likely I am to be friendly to my neighbor might well depend on 
you know, the structure of our market competition. I think you're right. Um, but for now, it's outside kind of the scope of what I was looking at. Um, but it may be something to think about in the future. Um, then policy is an interesting one, right? So your question is, if I have limited resources as a government, and I am aware that this is a problem, should I focus more on getting firms access to international suppliers? Or do I just worry about the domestic market or some combination of the two? Yeah, like the um, booboo, you know, the buy Uganda, build Uganda <laughs> exactly. policy. So, I mean, maybe they could be contradictory somehow. So uh, this project was interlinked with Boo-Boo. So uh, I had a, quite an interesting presentation with the Ministry of Trade where, you know, there was a big debate about what the right policy was to do here. Certainly I'm, I'm arguing that restricting imports would not be beneficial, uh, at least within the kind of purview of this, this model. Um, and indeed, my, my, my argument would be if you have an option of one or the other, reducing international uh, search costs would be a better move than the domestic market because not only will that have a positive effect on the international market, but it also potentially has a positive effect on the domestic market because of this interdependency within the model where moving into international market doesn't necessarily mean that your domestic suppliers disappear. It may well also mean that actually some of those firms get picked up by other firms. Um, so, you know, if I'm using both, it, actually it can increase the size of the pie. Um, and I mean, there's tons of evidence to suggest that more generally, right? You know, my framework is one framework, but we have a huge literature on imports and domestic productivity, for example, and we, we know that there's a lot of evidence to suggest if firms get access to imported inputs, they are actually much more likely to be you know, productive and uh, able to export, etc. And so, if Uganda compares about cares about its international competitiveness, its access to varieties, its access to quality, it would be probably a substantial mistake to shut down imports. The one thing I would caveat I will throw on that is, I don't think I think you can do these things together. So the discussion Abdul Rashid and I were having was actually, you know, there are resources which really dramatically reduce search costs, both domestically and internationally through these kind of IT solutions. And many of those are complementary between the two, right? I can certainly imagine giving, you know, a training session to firms on using Alibaba, but also using Jumia. And, you know, you could do that at the same time. And I think you could well see improvements in both of those markets at the same time. I don't, I don't see that it has to be, I can only do one or the other. Okay, very good. Uh, if you still give us a couple of minutes, um, let's have last uh, round of questions uh, from Palavi this time. Uh, thank you, John, for your interesting presentation. Um, I just have one clarification. Maybe I, I missed out uh, this point. Um, so one of your conclusions is that um, consumer welfare increased by 12% due to uh, reduction in search costs. Um, I was wondering whether you also account for heterogeneity in uh, a firm's ability to adopt, uh, adapt to a new um, policy that reduces search costs. Um, in the sense that I would imagine in developing countries, there are small firms, large firms, and whether they, uh, that would uh, affect your results. Now, again, coming to uh, say, uh, there's, there has been a discussion about using digital technologies to further reduce search costs um, to uh, in, as an improve uh, consumer welfare. But again, uh, depending on a firm's ability to adopt to a new technology, like suppose they are not um, uh, tech savvy, so then it, it might not have the same similar effects. So I just wanted you to comment on that. Uh, yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I, it's not within the model. Um, so the way I'm modeling this is essentially there is a cost of searching. Um, and so I'm reducing that cost of searching. Firms would like to match with every firm that they could. Um, and so it, it makes it easier for these firms to, to make matches. But yeah, your really interesting point is actually maybe it makes it more uh, possible for certain suppliers to match, not all suppliers to match, um, which is not something I'm modeling, but it would be a really interesting extension um, to think about uh, what would happen. And so, you know, I think you can think through the intuition of what would happen. Well, I guess if, if it's the case that only certain firms are able to adopt the technology, then you would see that those firms grow and the other firms would, would decline. Um, 
but yeah, that's it's not within my current framework, but I think it's something you could incorporate and I, I think would be quite interesting. Thanks for the suggestion. Okay, um, very good. If there are no more questions um, at this stage, uh, I think we should close uh, for today. Uh, so thank you again so much, John, for uh, your very insightful presentation. Um, in the case you want to read more details, uh, there was a link to this paper uh, in the invitation. So thank you again uh, and see you soon. Thanks, everyone. It's a real pleasure to meet you all. Hopefully sometime in the future in person. Definitely. <laughs>